Hello my friends, this is Dr. Beter. Today is November 8, 1981, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 69. A few days ago, on the morning of November 4, the eyes of the world were on Cape Canaveral, Florida. An American Space Shuttle sat poised for launch on Pad 39A, the home of America's moon flights a decade ago. According to NASA, the Shuttle was scheduled for launch at 7.30 that morning. What we were watching, my friends, was another NASA publicity hoax. NASA had no intention of actually launching the Shuttle that day. The Shuttle now at Cape Canaveral is not the Columbia as claimed. It is the Training Shuttle Enterprise, as I reported last June in AUDIO LETTER No. 65. It is there for only one reason, to help NASA buy time. It was the Enterprise, not the Columbia, that we saw making that dramatic landing in California last April. Most Americans are unaware that the Columbia was destroyed in space after it took off from Cape Canaveral. NASA is continuing to buy time, while secret modifications of the next Space Shuttle are underway at White Sands, New Mexico, and so right now we're seeing hoaxes like the aborted countdown on November 4. As I mentioned a moment ago, NASA had no intention of allowing an actual launch earlier this week. What they did want was an exciting countdown to sustain public interest and explain away the next delay. The key to the NASA publicity show was the master countdown computer called the Automatic Sequencer. It was deliberately programmed to delay the countdown at T-9 minutes and then to stop it completely just 31 seconds before launch. With those arrangements made, NASA forged ahead with its pretended launch preparations. For several days ahead of time, NASA spokesmen solemnly said that the weather would have to be almost perfect at launch time. The reason we were told over and over was that the shuttle might have to abort its takeoff and glide back to land at Cape Canaveral. That is exactly the plan which I made public last June in AUDIO LETTER No. 65. The military shuttle planners are still actively considering a deliberately aborted launch soon, and they want to prepare us in case they carry it out. But on November 4 the launch preparations were only make-believe, and so NASA pressed ahead with the countdown with only lip service to the worsening weather. The countdown went without a hitch to the T-9 minutes mark and then stopped for a final planned hold. We were told that this was the decision point when launch control would either go ahead or scrub. Newsmen craned their necks at the worsening clouds and shook their heads. It began to rain on spectators ten miles from the launch pad. Then the rain reached the VIP stand, twice as close to the shuttle. Next rain started pelting TV reporters at their forward outposts, closest of all to the launch pad. Surely, they said, NASA would have to scrub the launch. But to NASA Launch Control only the countdown itself mattered that day. They knew there could be no launch because the countdown computer had been programmed to prevent it, and so the announcement from NASA surprised many. Their decision was to go ahead for a launch. The final nine minutes of the countdown were used to help lay the foundation for things to come. First the countdown computer refused to resume the count at T-9 minutes. Shortly NASA announced that it was merely a computer programming problem. Moments later the count began. Everything went smoothly until T-31 seconds. Then the count stopped again. Once again, said NASA, it was a programming goof. The shuttle itself was fine, we were told, but the computer had not been given the right instructions. By that point, my friends, it was a critical point in the count, so close to launch. The Shuttle fuel tanks had been sealed up, ready to go. The Shuttle had been cut loose from its ground links and was trembling with power, ready to go. All kinds of things had to be shut down, cooled off, reset, and recycled for another try. For the next two hours or so, television reports concentrated on how crucial computers are to the Shuttle. They ended up making one basic point, and that is, even if the Shuttle itself is in perfect condition, a mistake in programming its computers can cause the unexpected to happen. This, my friends, is NASA's way of getting us ready to accept it 
if they do carry out a so-called return to landing site abort. They will say afterward that it was all caused by a computer programming problem. They will emphasize that the shuttle itself performed perfectly, and so the shuttle project should not be interfered with. Finally, when they are ready for the third shuttle launch, they will assure us that the computer problems have all been solved. This, my friends, was the true purpose of the November 4 Shuttle Countdown hoax. They have now paved the way for an aborted takeoff soon if they choose to carry out the plan I made public in AUDIO LETTER No. 65. Having accomplished that much, the NASA launch team finally scrubbed the November 4 launch with a different excuse. We're being told that the hydraulic power units called APUs need an oil and filter change, and with that story NASA is once again buying more time. Using one excuse after another, NASA has succeeded so far in slipping the next shuttle launch time after time without arousing public suspicion. It's now almost seven months since the first shuttle launch on April 12, 1981. Even so, these delays cannot continue indefinitely. The countdown for the Space Shuttle program is only part of a far greater countdown, the Countdown Toward Nuclear War One. Earlier this year of 1981 I revealed that the American Bolsheviks here are trying to follow a definite timetable in their war plans. That timetable calls for the war sequence to begin around mid-1982. A chain of events will begin that is to culminate finally in NUCLEAR WAR ONE. My friends, up to now they are still on that timetable. Mid-1982 is less than a year away now, and so regardless of the low chances of success, the Military Space Shuttle Team will have to try a launch soon. Whatever they try will be a desperate gamble in light of Russia's overwhelming military power in space, but time is slipping away for the Space Shuttle. The choice is gradually becoming either use it or lose it. The State Socialists here, the American Bolsheviks, who now control America's military policies, are in a frenzy to throw America's nuclear arsenal at Russia. During recent weeks this military frenzy has been manifesting itself in many ways. These range from the so-called Reagan Administration decision on the MX missile and B-1 bomber to shocking statements about limited nuclear war. At the same time, America's economy is being dragged down into an inflationary depression to set the stage for dictatorship. And most ominous of all, my friends, a specific act has taken place since my last AUDIO LETTER report that has lit one of the fuses for war. In a number of recent tapes I have discussed the similarity between the multiplying crises of today and those that led up to World War I. Those crises set the stage, but a specific incident acted as the trigger that led to war. That event, my friends, was the unexpected assassination of a key political figure. It happened in 1914, and now in 1981 it has happened again. My three special topics for this AUDIO LETTER are Topic No. 1, the Sadat assassination for Nuclear War One; Topic No. 2, the Reagan Administration program to Polandize America, and Topic No. 3, the MX Decision and America's First Strike Posture Topic No. 1. Assassination politics can be counted on always to strike without warning. One fateful day it struck in a capital city not far from the Mediterranean Sea. The day began without a hint of what was about to happen. The Mediterranean sun was bright and warm, the sort of day that is perfect for picnics and parades. An unusual leader was scheduled to be seen in public appearances on that fateful day. He was a strong-minded man, not universally admired, but certainly an attention-getter. For his public appearances that day he was all decked out with a full complement of medals to enhance his image. He was a controversial man, and his policies were stirring up heated debate. 
He had staked out a course in foreign policy that set him apart from others in his region. There were many who did not like his ideas. Throughout the region in which this unusual man lived, deep divisions were threatening to explode into violence. The central problem had to do with a disenfranchised minority who were scattered through parts of the several nations. This minority group were the victims of great power maneuvering that had changed the map a generation earlier. They had been left without the national identity they craved and scattered through parts of several nations. For decades the people of this disenfranchised minority had been struggling to regain their rights, and slowly but surely they were growing more powerful. These facts weighed heavily in the mind of the controversial leader on that bright sunny day. He was convinced that the course which he was promoting was the right one. He was involved in negotiations that could lead to a form of regional autonomy for the disenfranchised minority. They would be given this autonomy within the nations where they lived. His public appearances on that sunny day were intended to underscore his determination to continue down his chosen course. It was only a matter of time, he thought, until his own diplomatic ideas brought lasting peace to his troubled region and honor to himself. That was this man's dream, my friends, but the dream ended abruptly as a nightmare. In the warmth of the bright Mediterranean sun the chilling shock of assassination politics suddenly intervened. There was a hail of gunfire, and this man who had staked out such an independent course lay dead. The assassination was followed immediately by questions piled on more questions. How big was the conspiracy? The answer at first appeared to be only a handful, perhaps four or five men. Later there were hints that it might have been much bigger than that. What about the suspicious behavior of the neighboring government toward the assassinated leader? The evidence was conflicting about that. And why had effective protection been so completely lacking for such an important leader? To this day, my friends, that question remains a mystery. It is often said that history repeats itself, and so it does, my friends, if only we can learn to see it. I have just described not just one historical event, but two. One of these events was the assassination of the entity known as President Anwar Sadat of Egypt last month on October 6. The other event, which fits exactly the same description, was an assassination which took place 67 years ago. I am referring to the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria on June 28, 1914. The assassination last month took place in the Egyptian capital city of Cairo, some 100 miles south of the Mediterranean coast. The victim was the entity President Sadat. Over the past half decade Sadat had become highly controversial and isolated in the Arab world. The reason for this was his involvement with Israel by way of the so-called Camp David Accords. The great problem in the Middle East today is, of course, that of the Palestinians. They are the disenfranchised minority of today, victims of the great power of map-making which created Israel a generation ago. The Palestinians, largely dispossessed from their former homeland, are today scattered like orphans throughout several nations but they have never lost their determination to regain their rights and their national identity, and slowly but surely they are growing more powerful. Most Arab leaders today support these Palestinian aspirations in undiluted form, but four years ago Sadat broke ranks with his Arab brothers by his unilateral overtures toward Israel. From that time onward Sadat became identified with a sort of halfway solution to the Palestinian problem. That solution is called autonomy." Quote, unquote. These days we hear frequently about so-called autonomy talks between Egypt and Israel. To you and me, thousands of miles away from the scene, the concept of regional autonomy for the Palestinians may sound pretty good, but to the Palestinians themselves it is no solution at all. They see it as nothing more than a way to lock them into their present homeless status for all time, and, my friends, they are exactly right about that. 
After all, the Palestinians themselves are not even party to the so-called autonomy talks which are to decide their fate. So this was the situation last month on October 6. The Middle East seething with unresolved tensions from great power map-making of a generation earlier, a disenfranchised minority struggling to re-establish their national identity, and a single unorthodox leader seeking a halfway solution based on so-called regional autonomy for the minority. It sounds like a situation unique to our age. But, my friends, it is not unique. In important ways it is almost a carbon copy of the situation that exploded into World War I. In 1914 the hot spot of the world was not the Middle East but the Balkan Peninsula. The disenfranchised minority of that day were not the Palestinians but the grouping of peoples known collectively as the Yugoslavs. Yugoslavia as we know it today did not exist in 1914. Instead, the map of the region was a patchwork of names like Serbia, Bosnia, and Herzegovina. Scattered throughout the region were the interrelated Yugoslav peoples. They had been robbed of their power and identity a generation earlier, and they wanted it back. For several years before the outbreak of World War I, these tensions led repeatedly to outbreaks of fighting in the Balkans. Into this dangerous situation stepped Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the throne of Austria of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was afraid the Balkan situation could lead to a breakup of his empire, and so he proposed a halfway solution to pacify the Yugoslavs while preserving the status quo. His plan for this disenfranchised minority was called Regional Autonomy. It was virtually a prototype for the so-called autonomy plan we hear about today for the Palestinians. The Yugoslavs were no more pleased with the so-called autonomy idea in 1914 than the Palestinians are today in 1981. It was a situation made to order to set the stage for assassination. That was true in 1914 and it was true again in 1981, barely a month ago. The two assassinations differed in detail, but in overall pattern they were much the same. Archduke Ferdinand appeared in an open car wearing the medals and trappings of royalty. Sadat appeared at a parade dressed in the medals and trappings of the military. Both were shot to death without the assassins being interfered with by security personnel until too late. Both were killed in capital cities near the Mediterranean. Archduke Ferdinand in the provincial capital of Sarajevo, Bosnia, Sadat in Cairo, Egypt. Both assassinations were followed immediately by suspicions directed against a neighboring state. In the case of Sadat the suspicions were aimed at neighboring Libya. In the case of Archduke Ferdinand it was Serbia that drew accusations. And those accusations, my friends, initiated a process that led directly to World War I. If all these things were not enough, there is one other crucial similarity today with the situation in 1914. On the eve of World War I there were two great power blocks opposing one another in Europe. One was called the Triple Entente, consisting of Britain, France, and Tsarist Russia. The other was the Triple Alliance made up of Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy. These two great power blocks were something new and dangerous in continental politics. They were permanent alliances instead of the temporary special purpose alliances of the past. They were the legacy of balance of power politics from the era of Bismarck and Disraeli. The two blocks were so evenly matched that it was thought that they would keep the peace but they both shared a common weak spot. That weak spot was the Balkan Peninsula. In themselves the Balkans were minor players on the world stage, but there were treaties between the Balkan mini-states and the Great Powers. It was through those ties that the Great Powers were pulled into what became World War I. Today, my friends, we live once again in an era when two great power blocks have been facing each other for decades. One is centered on Russia and the other on the United States together with their allies. For example, in Europe itself NATO stands eyeball to eyeball with the Warsaw Pact 
year in, year out. Today it is far worse than in 1914. It is more complicated, and secret alliances are now being forged. And just as 1914 had its weak spot in the Balkans, the 1981 weak spot is the Middle East together with the Persian Gulf. In 1914 the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand came as a shock to the world. It was the trigger that started a chain of events that culminated in World War I. Austria-Hungary accused Serbia of complicity in the assassination and issued a harsh ultimatum. Little Serbia responded by appealing to Russia for protection, and Russia agreed to provide it. Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. Russia started mobilizing. Austria-Hungary appealed to its ally Germany, which promptly declared war on Russia. Germany asked Russia's ally France to stay out of it, but the French were evasive. Germany then declared war on France and prepared to march through Belgium to attack France. Britain gave a warning to Germany not to violate Belgium's neutrality. The Germans started marching anyway. Britain declared war on Germany. The situation kept on snowballing like this until all of Europe was aflame with war. It was a war for which there could emerge no winners except for unseen powerful forces behind the scenes. But those forces had succeeded in setting off the unwinnable war for their own selfish ends, and they started it all with a surprise assassination. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 68 on September 30, I gave a warning that the entity Sadat was being set up for assassination. The State Socialists or American Bolsheviks here are trying to set off Nuclear War I by means of techniques similar to those which led to World War I 67 years ago and the time had come at last to use Sadat to help further the plan for war. Contrary to appearances, the late President Anwar Sadat did not initiate negotiations with Israel four years ago on his own initiative. Instead he had been turned into an involuntary puppet of the United States and Israel. I first revealed what had been done to Sadat four years ago this month in AUDIO LETTER No. 28. Up until the spring of 1977, Anwar Sadat had always rejected the idea of direct negotiations with Israel. In April of that year Sadat visited Washington for talks with the then President Carter. When reporters asked whether he would consider direct negotiations with Israel, Sadat again dismissed the idea as too drastic. Yet a little more than six months later Sadat electrified the world with his sudden peace initiative and visit to Israel. In AUDIO LETTER No. 28 I reported what had happened to Sadat to so radically change his thinking. Sadat had been subjected to the psychological programming techniques which are secretly in use by the United States and other intelligence agencies. He was programmed with an irresistible compulsion to go against all of his past thinking and deal directly with Israel. The bottom line was what I reported four years ago. To repeat what I reported then, quote, the Sadat Peace Initiative to Israel is supposed to be, unknown to Sadat himself, the first step toward war, unquote. Last month the Sadat image was put to its final use by the secret Joint Military Junta of the United States Pentagon and Israel. The assassination in Cairo ended the Sadat era, and at the same time it started the countdown toward collapse of the Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty on the way to war. Within hours of the assassination, Israeli leaders began expressing doubts whether the peace will survive without Sadat and they said that this could cause a reappraisal of the plan for Israel to complete its withdrawal from the Sinai on schedule next spring. When Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in June of 1914, it led very quickly to the outbreak of war. The war was getting underway by early August, a scant six weeks after the assassination. Today the same unseen forces and their principles are at work but the situation is more complicated. 
As a result, it would be a mistake to expect the same timetables to apply, but the hollow echoes of 1914 are growing louder and louder in the Middle East today. For the moment, the complex maneuvers of the American Bolshevik Zionist Junta of the United States and Israel are shifting to other areas than Egypt. On one hand, we are hearing more and more about Libya. We're gradually being conditioned to the idea that the Libyan strongman, Gaddafi, is a madman who might do just about anything. This, my friends, is just another ingredient which is being prepared to be thrown into the American Bolshevik Zionist War Cauldron. When the right moment arrives, Gaddafi can be programmed to do something seemingly insane to help bring on war. As long ago as 1974, I reported over radio station WMCA in New York that Libya is under the United States CIA control. Gaddafi and his henchmen had been brought to the United States and trained by the CIA to carry out a coup d'etat. Gaddafi then went back, carried out the coup, and installed himself as Libya's new leader. He also installed the CIA as his indispensable helper. These, my friends, are the facts behind the shocking recent reports of American involvement in Libya. But more important than Libya is Saudi Arabia. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 68 on September 30, it seemed that the crucial AWACS deal with Saudi Arabia was in trouble, but I reported that Israel secretly wanted the AWACS deal to be approved. This is part of the plan to set up Saudi Arabia to look like a credible threat to Israel. That will give Israel the excuse it needs to carry out a limited nuclear strike on the Saudi oil fields. My friends, the decisive turning point in the AWACS debate was the assassination of Anwar Sadat. From that day onward, undecided United States Senators started coming down in favor of the AWACS deal. Some key Senators even changed from being against it to being for it and said the Sadat assassination had changed their minds. On October 28, the AWACS sale to Saudi Arabia was approved by the United States Senate. It was the point of no return for the Middle East. The peace overtures of the late Anwar Sadat have served their intended purpose. These peace overtures have started the world down the road to thermonuclear war. Topic No. 2 Two days ago there was a new flood of bad economic news out of Washington. Official unemployment figures jumped from 7.5 to 8 percent in October, just one month's time. The deep slumps in housing and autos are getting deeper, and the Reagan promise of a balanced Federal budget by 1984 has now been officially abandoned. At the same time, government figures show that more and more people are going deeper and deeper into debt. Even as the economy slows down, galloping inflation is continuing to make it harder to make ends meet. Meanwhile, the privately owned Federal Reserve Corporation is maintaining the high interest rates that are strangling the economy. It has been only a few short weeks since America's recession was first admitted at all by the President. The entity President Reagan startled reporters by saying the country is in a mild recession. Then other government spokesmen softened the blow, calling it a flat period, quote, unquote. Now these casual-sounding early admissions are being replaced by reports that grow worse by the day. America's economy is turning sour too fast for reassuring smiles and empty phrases to hide it any longer. If you want to understand what is really happening to the United States economy, you must keep your eyes on the basics. There are two critical sectors of the economy which are the keys to bringing about prosperity or depression. Those sectors are automobiles and housing. Both are in deep trouble now, and as they go down they are pulling down our whole economy with them. The techniques which were used to bring on the Great Depression of the 1930s are once again being used now. Six years ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 5 I talked briefly about the wise German professor who taught me finance, banking, and economics. In the 1920s this man had been consulted by the Rockefeller interests 
who claimed that they wanted to know how to deflate inflation. But once he had shown them how it could be done, they misused his information to create the Great Depression instead. This German economist confided many things to me, and one was how economies are manipulated. He showed me how the key sectors of housing and the automobiles can be used to bring down a whole economy, and three years ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 41 I gave an early warning that this process was being set in motion. As I reported then, General Motors betrayed its advanced knowledge of the plan for a new American Depression on November 7, 1978. On that day GM slashed its dividend rates in half on GM stock. GM's action three years ago took the stock market by surprise because auto sales had been good, but since that time interest rates have climbed into the loan shark range and both automobiles and housing have hit upon hard times. A few days ago it was announced that auto sales in the United States have slumped to their lowest level in 23 years. The last time things were this bad we were in the severe recession of 1957 to 1958, but my friends, you haven't seen anything yet. Housing is no better off. Incredible interest rates combined with unchecked inflation and basic prices have cut housing sales of all kinds to a trickle. When you hear those monthly statistics about deepening unemployment, my friends, keep in mind that they are only a symptom of what is happening. General unemployment is following down the same path that is being taken in housing and autos. In many metropolitan areas, unemployment in construction trades has already reached 20 percent and is still increasing. Likewise, layoffs are steadily increasing the unemployment rate in autos. Lost jobs in those two sectors mean other businesses will slow down too and so general unemployment can do nothing but get worse as things stand right now. Millions of American working people are growing nervous as they see what is happening. Many are especially worried because they sense a fundamental shift taking place in the government's attitude toward labor. Several weeks ago these worries were expressed in the so-called Solidarity Day rally of a quarter million people right here in Washington. This time the rally was peaceful, but I must report that forces are now at work that are threatening to erupt in violent riots both here in Washington and in other major cities soon. One catalyst for these riots is likely to be the abrupt cancellation of benefits for the needy. The problem is not so much what is being done as the way it is being done. Instead of phasing out these programs in a way that would give a period of adjustment, they are just being lopped off. Many people are being made to feel that they are being cast onto the trash heap. Resentment and desperation are building. At the same time, shortages are coming in America. These shortages will come to include food sooner than most of us imagine. One of the favorite political weapons of the Bolsheviks has always been hunger because it is so powerful. They used it long ago in Russia. They are using it today in Poland, and they will use it tomorrow right here in the United States. Widespread hunger can be brought about in America even if there is no lack of agricultural production. In that respect the situation has changed dramatically during the past year. Because, my friends, the Soviet Union has called off its program of weather modification to reduce our crops. If you will recall, the Bolshevik-dominated former Carter Administration declared a grain embargo against Russia in January 1980. The following month I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 54 that the Kremlin was retaliating by means of massive modification of America's weather. For the next four months I was not able to give monthly updates on the situation because I was recovering from a near-fatal heart attack, but by the time I resumed my AUDIO LETTER no. series in June 1980 the weather had become big news here in America. Vast growing areas of the United States were in the grip of a scorching drought that was both unexpected and very severe. 
The Russians made sure that they got their point across to our peanut farmer President then in office. For the first time on record, the Deep South peanut crop failed in 1980. It was destroyed by the weather. The United States grain embargo against Russia had been a Bolshevik attempt to use the hunger weapon on an international scale, but it backfired. The Russians tightened their belts a notch but suffered little. Instead, it was the United States that was on the brink of an era of hunger due to crop failure, and it would have taken place in ways that could have caused real trouble for our own unseen rulers. They want to impose hunger on you and me, but only on their own timetable as a way to control us. And so six months ago the grain embargo against Russia was ended. As a result, America's weather returned to normal during the summer of 1981 just past. The drought-stricken areas of a year ago have in many cases received drenching rains to restore their productivity. As I said earlier, the immediate threat of hunger in America is no longer due to crop failure caused by Russian weather modification. Instead, when hunger strikes, it may well be brought about by a sudden disruption of our food distribution system. Today we live in an age of agribusiness, with production of most of our foodstuffs concentrated in a few prime areas. The greatest concentration of all is in California, which produces from 40 to 50 percent of many of our fruits and vegetables. Other agricultural states specialize in other parts of our food supply, grains, meats, and so forth. What ties the whole country together so that we all have food to eat is transportation. There is a motto that says, America's needs move by truck. Nowhere is that more true than it is for our food supply. Supermarkets nationwide carry only about a three-day supply of food on their shelves. They have to be restocked continuously by a steady stream of trucks. Trucks, my friends, depend upon petroleum supplies in order to keep moving. Once the Saudi oil fields are capped off by the Israeli nuclear strike, there will be a sudden cutoff of much of our oil. If the plan is carried out successfully, it will mean gas rationing and restricted movement for us all. It will also mean serious disruptions in food distribution. A while ago I mentioned the recent Washington rally under the name Solidarity Day. In a way, that was an ironic name to choose. It makes one think of the so-called Solidarity Labor Union in Poland. In Poland the Solidarity Union is a tool of the American Bolsheviks who are trying to destroy the economy for purposes of revolution and war. Here in America the American Bolsheviks are also trying to destroy the economy and for similar reasons, but here they are trying to do it through the government itself. As America's economy continues to deteriorate, the battle continues in the secret power struggle to control the United States Government. The two factions in this power struggle are the State Bolsheviks and the Corporate Fascists, as I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 67. Lately this struggle is surfacing in public skirmishes. The latest example is the flap over the White House guerrilla campaign quote unquote, against Secretary of State Alexander Haig. Meanwhile, the destruction of our economy is continuing. Our country is being Polandized. That is, America is being weakened economically to set the stage for war, just as is being done to Poland. America's economic destruction is being orchestrated by the money managers of the Federal Reserve Corporation and Treasury Department. But to maintain the pretense of trying to help our economy, the plan for a bogus new gold standard for our currency or Treasury bonds is still moving ahead quietly. I can report that the Federal Gold Commission has now had its life quietly extended by Congress until March 31, 1982. The gold standard ploy is intended to look good, but it is a sham. How can an alleged gold standard mean anything if the alleged gold reserves do not exist? After all, when President Nixon closed the gold window in 1971, it was because America's gold reserves had been secretly depleted. Nixon's Treasury Secretary at the time was John Connolly, 
and he has now gone public with strong opposition to the gold standard idea, and his reason is simple. Last month the New York Times for October 19 quoted Connolly as saying, We don't have the gold. Unquote. Wherever you look, there are nothing but questions about the true status of America's gold supplies. For example, three years ago the major media for once created a sensation about the New York Assay Office. They reported correctly that some 5,000 ounces of gold were missing, gone without a trace. Well, my friends, the major media ought to go back and check again with their sources. For the fiscal year ended September 30, 1981, there is still more gold missing at the New York Assay Office. Supposedly there was a tightening of security and procedures there after the scandal three years ago. At least that's what the Treasury Department told the public. But for this past year alone another 3,163 ounces of gold have vanished. Yes, my friends, America is being polarized. Just as Poland is the victim of deliberate economic turmoil, so are we. The objective in Poland is to bring on social upheaval, bloodshed, and the prelude to war. And that is also the objective right here in the United States. When unemployment and hunger riots materialize, they will trigger the secret military operation Garden Plot, which I first reported in the summer of 1975. It is all part of the plan for a national emergency to come on the way to NUCLEAR WAR ONE. Topic No. 3 Early last month on October 2, the entity President Reagan announced his long-awaited decision on the MX missile program. For the past several years we've been hearing about the MX and all kinds of possible mobile basing for it. We've been told that the MX will have to be mobile in order to survive a Russian nuclear attack. Having heard this for years, a lot of people were shocked when they heard the Reagan decision on the MX. He declared that the famous MX racetrack system out west will not be built after all. Instead, they will simply be used to replace aging Titan missiles when deployment begins in 1986. At least that is the announced plan for the first 36 MX missiles. The President said in effect that he doesn't yet know what to do with the rest of the MXs that will be built. That is so even though the Reagan Administration plans to build only a hundred of them, half as many as previously planned. Many people who closely follow defense matters were stunned by the announcement. Whatever happened to the mobile missile idea, they wondered. My friends, the answer is still what I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 55 in June 1980. America's real mobile missile is not the MX at all, but a smaller, completely secret missile. It's called the Minuteman TX, and it is being deployed now on America's railroads. Each TX missile is transported in a special car with a barn-like peak roof. A number of my listeners have seen and photographed Minuteman TX missile cars since I described them in my June 1980 report. About six months ago I released a special bulletin which presents two of these photographs. In AUDIO LETTER No. 55 I explained that the publicity surrounding the so-called MX program was only a cover for the secret TX mobile missile program. Recently I reported uh, that the TX missile deployment is scheduled to be completed by next spring, around six months from now. Now that the program is nearing completion, the MX mobile missile cover story has just about run its course. That's why the Reagan Administration is now dropping its pretenses that the MX will be mobile. Controversy will continue to swirl around the MX program, but the idea of a mobile missile is now changing in official public statements. Now that the Minuteman TX system is becoming an accomplished fact, we are beginning to hear trial balloons to get us used to the idea. For example, Senator John Glenn appeared on the CBS television program Face the Nation last month on October 18. Senator Glenn said that the Department of Defense ought to deploy a smaller mobile missile than the MX. He proposed putting them in trailers 
on the nation's roads traveling all around the country. The system he described was almost identical to the secret TX, the Traveling Minuteman, which I made public 17 months ago. There was only one important difference in what Senator Glenn described. He carefully avoided talking about railroads but instead talked about truck trailers. If he had mentioned railroads, he would have let the cat out of the bag, because railroads are how the secret TX missiles are actually deployed. The deep secrecy surrounding the Minuteman TX program springs from the fact that it is not a defensive weapon. America's secret military planners plan to use it in a nuclear first strike against Russia. On top of that, the TX missiles in our midst are placing all of us on the front lines for a nuclear attack. Today we are all in the trenches. Up to now the major media have maintained a news blackout on my charges to this effect, but one magazine has now had the courage to publish my charges together with TX missile car photographs. The magazine is called Combat Ready. My charges are published in an article titled, Is the MX a Shoot First Weapon? It is in the January 1982 issue which just went on sale nationwide. I first reported that America was secretly shifting to a first strike nuclear policy against Russia in the summer of 1978. At the time many people found that idea unbelievable, but now as war itself draws closer, the first strike posture of the United States is becoming more and more obvious. Soon after the Reagan MX decision was announced last month, its first strike implications were spelled out in the New York Times by Herbert Scoville, Jr. Scoville, a former Deputy Director of the CIA, wrote an article which begins with the words, quote, President Reagan's decision on the MX missile signals that the United States is now firmly and publicly embarked on a first strike strategic nuclear policy. This is a prescription for a nuclear disaster, a disaster unparalleled in the history of mankind." Unquote. Scoville points out that the MX, as advertised, makes sense only as a first strike weapon. For one thing, the MX is alleged to be an anti-ICBM weapon, but the only way the MX could destroy Russian ICBMs sitting on the ground would be if the Russians had not fired them yet. In other words, we would have to shoot first. Scoville points out that the shoot first idea becomes even more necessary in light of the decision to put them in old Titan silos. The Defense Department itself says that Russia's largest missiles, quote, are capable of destroying any known fixed target with high probability, unquote. In other words, the Titan silos cannot be hardened enough to protect them from Russian missiles, so the only way the MX could be used would be to shoot first. If all Americans were aware of authoritative statements of alarm like this one, perhaps disaster could be averted, but most people these days never hear such warnings. If we are lucky and alert, we may see it once in a newspaper, but it is soon washed away by the never-ending flood of lies from Washington. Most of us remain oblivious to the danger, and so we raise not a word in protest as our leaders sell us down the river to disaster. Even so, the secret first strike preparations of the United States are not entirely without opposition. The plan is known within the walls of the Kremlin, and Russia's leaders are at work on several fronts. For one thing, they are continuing the campaign of attrition against America's war-making capacity which they started several years ago. One day a railroad train derails and several chemical tank cars bound for a defense plant explode. Another day an unexplained explosion wipes a small weapons laboratory off the face of the earth. Next a rash of military plane crashes takes place. The pattern keeps changing constantly so that it cannot be identified, but it is there and it has its effect. What the Kremlin hopes for most in its campaign of attrition is that America's war plans will somehow be deterred altogether. That is their hope, but it is not what they actually expect. Of all people on earth, Russia's present-day leaders know the Bolshevik mind, 
So long as the Bolsheviks here continue to determine America's military policy, the Russians are convinced that war is inevitable, and so with their ongoing campaign of attrition they are trying to limit the damage that can be done to Russia. From time to time the Russians carry out something spectacular in their double campaign of deterrence and attrition. As I say these words, an incident has just ended that had deterrence as its main purpose. I'm referring to the celebrated case of the Soviet submarine which ran aground in super-sensitive restricted Swedish waters. Three weeks ago Defense Secretary Caspar Weinberger became the first American Defense Secretary ever to visit Sweden. He spent four days there. The Bolsheviks here want to entangle Sweden and all the North countries in their war plans. The Russians are equally determined to prevent that, so it was decided that Swedes should be encouraged to think twice before involving themselves militarily with the United States. Two submarines were dispatched to the Swedish coast. Both were instructed to use their sonar defeating equipment to penetrate the Swedish coastal defense zone. Next one was to play cat and mouse with Swedish anti-submarine forces. The other one was to let itself be discovered deliberately deep inside one of Sweden's most sensitive naval zones. This is how the case of Soviet Submarine 137 came about. It has been portrayed as an embarrassment for Russia, but it was really the opposite. The Russian sub-commander maneuvered his boat so deeply into tricky, heavily defended waters as to make it painfully obvious that it was no accident. Then in a demonstration of the wry Russian sense of humor, he carefully nudged his boat onto some rocks and just waited to be discovered. After a while the sub was discovered, not by the Swedish Navy, but by a fishing boat. At the purely professional military level it would be hard to imagine anything more embarrassing for the Swedish Navy or more sobering. Just to make sure though, the other Russian sub started through its paces as soon as Sub-137 had been found on the rocks. The second sub, deep within Swedish territorial waters, deactivated its sonar defeating equipment and then prowled around as noisily as possible until a Swedish anti-submarine warfare task group arrived. The Swedes were all set to start dropping depth charges on the seemingly trapped sub. Then the sonar defeating equipment was turned on again and the sub simply vanished. Taken all together, the total experience was a downright scary one for the Swedish Navy. The Russians allowed the Swedes to save face in the public eye, but it was the Swedes, not the Russians, who heaved a sigh of relief when Soviet Submarine 137 returned to international waters two days ago. The Russians are hoping the Swedes will not involve themselves in America's suicidal first strike posture, but my friends, they will. Now it's time for my last minute summary. As I say these words, an American Space Shuttle is once again being prepared for launch. We're told that it is the Shuttle Columbia, but that shuttle was destroyed by Russia last April. Instead it is the Training Shuttle Enterprise, relabeled Columbia, that now sets on the pad at Cape Canaveral. According to my latest information, NASA still plans to carry out an aborted mission of some type. It may be an aborted takeoff as I first reported last June, or it may be an abbreviated orbital mission, but in any event the lives of the astronauts are in very grave danger. Whatever NASA does, it will be a desperate gamble. They are trying to keep up public appearances so that their military space shuttle plans will not be halted, but Russian Cosmospheres are once again on patrol along the Cape Canaveral Launch Corridor. This shuttle is carrying no military payload, so perhaps they may not interfere. Perhaps. No matter what happens when the Space Shuttle takes off, one thing is certain. The government will not tell you and me the truth about it. The Space Shuttle could be a tool for peace, but our leaders are trying to use it instead to prepare for war, nuclear war. Like the Sadat assassination, the MX missile decision, and America's worsening economy, the Space Shuttle program is launching us into disaster. What we lack most of all these days is the truth. Our rulers have built their power on lies. So long as we accept those lies, 
We remain within their power to use and destroy us. They walk in darkness, and they try to keep us in the dark. The only way to break free, the only way, is to seek and cherish the truth. The light of the truth takes away the power of darkness and lies. The truth is the sword of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with it mankind can yet be free and live in peace. The choice, my friends, is up to you and me. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.